Um, so we spent Monday talking about O'Brien and what we might call the O'Brien analysis. So now it's time to apply it. For terminological purposes, we might want to think of this in terms of tribe's uh, taxonomy of uh, track one and track two, where track one is the uh, form of regulation that is directed to communicative impact and track two are incidental restrictions on communication as a result of a form of legislation uh, or statute or whatever uh, that's not directed to communicative impact. Okay, so with that um, said, let's spend a little time with Gregory Lee Johnson. Um, Mr. Johnson, as you read, um, burned an American flag, and he burned it as a form of protest. Uh, no question about that. No question about what his purpose was. No question about what his message was. No question about whether the audience understood what he was, in the figurative sense, saying. Uh, there was a message. The audience understood the message. It was the message that he in, uh, intended to convey. And then the question is, uh, under what circumstances, if any, can he be uh, prosecuted for this? So um, we can start by thinking about Texas's interest here. So Texas has a statute, uh, as did most states at the time, prohibiting the desecration of the American flag. Uh, but now, put aside the statute for a moment and think about what Texas's interest might have been. Uh, so, first of all, there is the possibility that it's, uh, this is not a possibility, it's actually a fact, it's dry in Texas. Uh, it's usually dry in Texas. When it's dry in Texas, there can be fires. So Texas might have said, we are very concerned about public burning. We are very concerned about the possibility that uh, people who burn things in public can start wildfires. So therefore, we are enacting a statute prohibiting public burning of anything except with a permit from the Department of the Environment or the Department of Public Safety or the local fire department or something of that variety. Now, um, if Texas had passed such a statute, if that had been the law, and if uh, that had been the law, and in consequence, Johnson was prosecuted for violating the public burning statute, it seems as if the first track of O'Brien is not implicated. That is, <laughs> Texas has an interest unrelated to the communicative <laughs> impact of the expression. Texas has an interest uh, that would be uh, as easily served or as fully served by prosecuting someone who burned leaves, by prosecuting someone who had a bonfire. Uh, the mere fact that Johnson's burning was a form of protest is inconsequential if that had been uh, the motivation. So um, if it turns out, now, uh, if that's the lesson of O'Brien, or at least one lesson of O'Brien, <coughs> the important idea is that that prosecution, <coughs> the permissibility of that prosecution, doesn't change even though Johnson was protesting, even though Johnson was communicating. So uh, if he is prosecuted for violating the no public burning statute and he says, excuse me, I was protesting. You don't seem to understand. I was not just burning leaves. I was not uh, just uh, engaged in some other form of non-communicative or non-expressive public burning. I was 
protesting. I was dissenting. I was speaking. At least in terms of the basic idea of the O'Brien analysis, the response is, so what? We'll get to the second part in a few minutes, uh, but at least the first prong of the O'Brien analysis, the, the answer is, so what? As long as the state's interest is unrelated to communicative impact, unrelated to the message, unrelated uh, to the, to the, even to the fact that he's communicating, the mere fact that he is communicating, speaking, expressing, protesting, dissenting, rebelling, uh, supporting, whatever, makes no difference at all. Now, two exceptions to uh, this, uh, where the this is the presumptive permissibility of prosecuting him under a no public burning statute. So exception number one, suppose it turns out that there is a no public burning statute and under the no public burning statute, Texas prosecutes with some vigor flag burners, draft card burners, uh, but does not prosecute leaf burners, bonfire makers, barbecue makers, barbecue, barbecuers, or even those who burn uh, flags of enemies of the United States. So they, they prosecute the barbecue, they don't prosecute the barbecuers, the leaf burners, uh, the communist flag burners, um, they do prosecute the American flag burners. If that's the case, then to bring you back to Con Law 1, Yikwo versus Hopkins, which you may remember becomes highly relevant. That is Yikwo, for um, just to refresh your recollection, Yikwo was the case in which uh, a seemingly neutral law a seemingly uh, even-handed, equal ac applicability law about uh, San Francisco laundries turned out to be applied only against those of Chinese origin and not against anyone else. The lesson of Yikwo, which is a hundred and some years ago, but is still clearly good law, is that we look at the state's motivation, we look at the state's goal, we look at the state interest, not only in terms of what's officially on the face of the statute, but also the actual practices of enforcement and a neutral or permissible or legitimate statute can become otherwise if in fact it is enforced or applied in an unconstitutional manner. Yikwo was an equal protection case, um, but there is nothing about the basic Yikwo principle that is restricted to equal protection. Yikwo can apply to religion, it can apply to equal protection, uh, and of course it can apply to speech. So if it turns out that the, the no public burning statute is applied only to American flag burners, then it is under Yikwo as if the statute prohibited the burning of the American flag and what might otherwise have been an interest unrelated to communicative impact becomes one because of the actual practice uh, of enforcement. So that's the first exception. Second exception. Um, so um, also going back a little bit to con law one. Suppose that we have a no public burning statute, but now there's actual evidence that the Texas legislature passed it in order to get flag burners. That's the issue we talked a little bit about on Monday. Under what circumstances can a otherwise permissible statute, can a statute that's permissible on its face become constitutionally impermissible because it was enacted for an unconstitutional reason? 
The court in O'Brien seems to say that that doesn't matter. The Supreme Court in a large number of cases since O'Brien have said, uh, in effect, yes, it does. Um, so whether it be Wallace versus Jaffrey about moments of silence at the beginning of a school day, um, or some suggestions in Hunt versus Washington Apple, which you may remember uh, from basic con law. Uh, the existence of an impermissible motivation can render the an otherwise neutral, otherwise permissible statute unconstitutional. For those of you who didn't encounter Hunt versus Washington Apple uh, in Con Law 1, just a brief uh, reminder uh, or introduction, as the case may be, Hunt versus Washington Apple dealt with a health regulation uh, from North Carolina designed to ensure that all of the apples consumed by North Carolina residents were healthy for consumption. There was considerable evidence that this law was enacted not because of a desire to deal with an epidemic of illness caused by tainted apples, but rather because it was thought that this would protect the North Carolina apple industry against the evil competition from state of Washington apples and other out-of-state apples. The Supreme Court didn't directly say that this itself would be a problem, but they strongly hinted that the motivation, the protectionist motivation, would render unconstitutional what would otherwise be a constitutional law. So whether it be a lot of the things that are said in Washington versus Davis, uh, or Hunt versus Washington Apple, um, uh, or Wallace versus Jaffrey, or whatever. Again, if the Texas no public burning statute had been enacted, not in order to deal with wildfires, not in order to deal with the problem of public burning, but to deal with the problem of ideological flag burners, then an otherwise constitutional statute might have become unconstitutional. Okay, uh, but this is not the actual statute. The actual statute, of course, was not a public burning statute. It was a flag desecration statute. Um, so um, how did Texas attempt to justify the uh, actual statute it had? Uh, one thing it said, and the thing that it stressed mostly, was we are enacting this statute preventing the desecration, prohibiting the desecration of the American flag in order to prevent breaches of the peace. Now, empirical observation. Those of you who doubt the empirical basis for Texas's claim uh, can engage in an experiment. Uh, take an American flag go to the um, front uh, yard or front area of the nearest veterans of foreign war post or American Legion post and burn the flag. Uh, you will discover a breach of the peace uh, that um, this, uh, this act uh, not only offends, but infuriates significant numbers of people. As we've seen in other contexts, states often, sometimes legitimately, sometimes as a pretense, um, try to guard or try to protect the speaker in these circumstances, uh, or try to protect public order in general in these circumstances. So Texas says there is very likely to be a breach of the peace if this happens. Uh, when people burn the flag, lots of other people get really, really angry and they can't control uh, themselves in their anger. Uh, we understand that. So in order to prevent these kinds of breaches of the peace, we are going to to prevent, uh, prohibit people um, from burning the, uh, burning the flag, from stimulating this kind of breach of the peace. Now, um, there's an interesting issue here. 
talked a little bit about, um, the, court, uh, the book talks a little bit about it, the court talks a little bit about it uh, in what's now footnote four uh, on page 187. Uh, so one initial issue is how are we to think about this concern? How are we to think about Texas's interest in light of the O'Brien analysis? So it is tempting to say preventing breaches of the pre peace is itself an interest unrelated to communicative impact. It is perfectly legitimate for the state to prohibit um, public assaults. It is perfectly legitimate for the state to prohibit public disorder perfectly legitimate for this state uh, to prevent all sorts of uh, public disturbances of the kind that commonly go under the rubric of disturbing the peace, breach of the peace, or something of that sort. So it is tempting to say Texas is in, and indeed it was very tempting for Texas to say uh, this kind of interest is in fact an interest unrelated, to use O'Brien's language, unrelated to the suppression of freedom of expression. One of the reasons that the O'Brien language is not as useful as the language of unrelated to communicative impact is in these circumstances it might very well be that it's unrelated uh, in terms of primary motivation to freedom of expression. That is, Texas might have said, it is merely a coincidence, not a coincidence of our making, that people get really, 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 really angry when others burn the American flag, and that they don't get really, 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 really angry when people burn uh, a communist flag. And therefore, Texas might say, we are not uh, expressing a preference about what form of burning we like or don't like. We are merely reflecting the contingent social um, situation, the contingent social landscape in which people engage in breaches of the peace when they see the American flag burned, but don't engage in breaches of the peace when they see uh, bonfires uh, or barbecue uh, or burnings of the communist flag or something of that variety. Uh, now, if we take O'Brien at its word and say the state motivation has to be unrelated to the suppression of freedom of expression, Texas might have a halfway decent argument. The argument becomes less good if we understand O'Brien's somewhat loose phrase as being about, in tribes terminology, communicative impact. That is, the breach of peace that exists under this motivation is a breach of the peace that is a function of the content of the communication. And indeed, if we were to think about Texas's interest as unrelated to content or unrelated to communicative impact, it might be that almost everything that we've done up to now in this course would become irrelevant. Uh, and that we could do, I could do this course as an after dinner speech rather than a three hour uh, course. So consider Brandenburg, for example. Um, uh, it might be the case that Ohio said, we are not interested in the suppression of freedom of expression we are interested in preventing assaults. It's perfectly permissible for us to uh, prohibit assaults. Our interest in prosecuting Brandenburg in his advocacy of acts of revengeance against African Americans and Jews is not an interest in preventing him from speaking. It is an interest in preventing the targets of Brandenburg's speech from engaging in assault uh, 
and therefore an interest in protecting the potential victims from assaults or worse. It turns out uh, that almost everything that we've done can be characterized in those terms. That is, if we think uh, it's, well, let me put it somewhat differently. Um, those of you who spend a fair amount of time um, reading common civil libertarian rhetoric <coughs> will frequently see that the government, state or federal, is charged with suppressing speech because they don't like the message. A common form of civil liberties rhetoric is government shouldn't be allowed to suppress speech just because they disagree with the message or don't like the message. <coughs> That's true but largely irrelevant. In almost every situation, uh, the government's interest asserted is not an interest in suppressing speech that the government disagrees with, is not a, uh, an interest in suppressing speech that the government dislikes. It is an interest in preventing a consequence of the speech, where the consequence can be described in terms unrelated to speech. So um, Ohio didn't say in Brandenburg, we don't like, we disagree with Brandenburg's message. They didn't say that. They said instead we want to, or they could have said, uh, we want to protect people against assault from Brandenburg's fellow Klansmen. That's not a disagreement with the message. Nevertheless, although it's not a disagreement with the message, the entire Brandenburg framework hinges on the fact that a state interest in the consequences of somebody's advocacy, where the consequences are a function of the content of the advocacy, is squarely in the middle of the basic Brandenburg principle. Uh, and so too in uh, a vast number of the other cases, principles, doctrines, maxims, canons, and everything else we've talked about and are part of the whole First Amendment area of First Amendment doctrine. So uh, unless Brandenburg is to be overruled, unless almost all of the other uh, central features of modern First Amendment doctrine are to be overruled. Texas's view that this is unrelated to content can't stand. That is, Texas's basic principle is uh, we want to protect breaches of, against breaches of the peace, but as long as the breaches of the peace are a function of the content of somebody else's speech, we're not in the unrelated uh, to communicative impact range. As long as these breaches of the peace would come from a burning of the American flag, but would not come from um, a burning with different content. Uh, even if it is a burning designed to convey a message. Uh, after all, it's plausible that at the uh, end of this course, you'll all want to go out and burn the case book uh, for purposes of sending a message. Uh, that probably wouldn't cause a breach of the peace uh, in ways that burning an American flag would. And as long as the breach of the peace comes from the content of what's said, we are within what seems to be the principle about uh, communicative impact. Um, so um, we can put this attempt by Texas aside, uh, and then, then Texas comes back, um, we might say, if we can reconstruct the dialectic. Texas then comes back and says, okay, you got us, that doesn't work. Uh, that's related to um, communicative impact, but people will be offended by this. Now, of course, that's the same idea. Uh, after 
Cohen versus California, after Hustler versus Falwell. Once again, content-based offense no longer suffices as a legitimate or sufficient First Amendment justification. Uh, so all of these things don't work. And then Texas comes back and says what it really means. OK, we admit it. This is a regulation designed to prohibit certain forms of conduct. And our interest is squarely based on the communicative impact of flag burning. <coughs> Nevertheless, they say, the flag is special. And indeed, most of the court's opinion in Texas versus Johnson um, is about the flag is special idea. That is uh, about the claim um, that um, flag burning is an exception to everything that would otherwise control the outcome in First Amendment terms. So they, Texas comes back and says, OK, um, all of these other arguments are, we admit, pretenses. This is content-based. This is viewpoint-based. We admit it's viewpoint-based. Uh, we don't prohibit celebratory uses of the American flag. We prohibit desecrity, if that's a word. Dese desecratory uses of the American uh, flag. That's clearly viewpoint-based discrimination. We are engaged in viewpoint discrimination. We admit it, but the flag is different. Uh, and it is at that point that the actual opinions in Texas versus Johnson become most interesting. So um, if you um, look at the full actual case, which is an interesting and important thing to do, uh, you will see that the casebook author's somewhat dismissive discussion um, in footnote A on page 191 doesn't capture the full breadth um, of uh, the Rehnquist majority opinion. So what we see in the um, majority opinion in its full version is the text of the Star-Spangled Banner, the text of Barbara Fritchie, long recountings of uh, the flag in American history, discussions of Betsy Ross, uh, discussions of various different kinds of flags and the purpose that the flag has served, and various different celebrations of that that appear in poetry, that appear in prose, that appear in song, uh, and so on. Now, it's easy, perhaps too easy, for the court, or at least the, uh, uh, the dissent, um, or the, excuse me, the majority, uh, easy or perhaps too easy to say um, none of this really matters. But now let's take the Chief Justice's dissent uh, somewhat more seriously. Here's one way of thinking about what he is saying. Imagine two different categories. 
So political protest, including flag burning, political protest other than flag burning. We've got two different categories. One way of understanding the majority opinion is to say the relevant category for purposes of thinking about whether this is a political speech case right at the core of the First Amendment uh, is the first category. Chief Justice Rehnquist said the relevant way of thinking about the category is the second category. And then the question is, which is the right way of thinking about this? And one of the interesting ironies of these two opinions <coughs> is that it is the majority opinion that looks traditional and the dissent that we might, it, that we might characterize as postmodern. So let me explain a little bit. Uh, so, um, one way of understanding postmodernism in art, in literature, in a whole bunch of other things is as a recognition that all of our language, all of our categories, uh, all of our ability to understand is socially constructed. That's a two-sentence summary of what lots of people have devoted their whole lives to, but put that aside. Uh, that at least postmodern perspectives focus on the social construction of language, the social construction of our categories, and therefore on the ultimate contingency of our categories, and therefore uh, on the ultimate uh, non-groundedness of our categories in anything other than contingent, changeable, variable, could have been otherwise uh, implicit social decisions. And postmodernists think that they are reacting against a uh, pre-postmodernist, whether that be modernist or pre-modernist or whatever, uh, reacting against a pre-postmodernist world in which people thought that our categories, our language, our words uh, were in some way natural, in some way firmly rooted in something that's unchangeable, in some way uh, fixed by the nature of the universe. And if you understand that um, two-minute summary of uh, uh, what, as I said, lots of people have devoted their lives to arguing about, uh, in an intriguing way, it is the majority opinion that's pre-postmodernist and the dissent that's postmodernist. That is, Chief Justice Rehnquist is saying, there is no natural reason why the category should be number one rather than number two. It is the category of political speech is defined by the society in which it takes place and the category of political speech in the United States as we know from the history, as we know from the poems and songs and everything else, the category of, the pol of political speech in the United States doesn't include flag burning. The majority says, in effect, the category of political speech must include flag burning. There is no social contingency involved. That's just what political speech is. The irony, of course, is that at least for many people, postmodernism, uh, the contingency of categories and everything else, broadly speaking, is associated with the political uh, left. Uh, and pre-postmodernism, broadly and loosely speaking, uh, the belief in the non-contingency of categories is associated with the right. Uh, and lo and behold, in Texas versus Johnson, it looks as if justices commonly associated with the left of center are adopting the traditional categories are natural things position, 
uh, and the justices m more commonly associated with the political right are the ones who are the postmodernists. Uh, indeed, um, in this context, think, for example, uh, or think um, about the fact that uh, in Germany, it is illegal to display Nazi regalia. It is illegal um, to um, form a political party that in any way resembles the National Socialist Party. Frank Collin and his American Nazis could not exist as a political party in Germany, although they exist as a political, or, or did exist, uh, as a uh, political party in the United States, uh, or a political organization in the United States. If you ask most Germans, or many Germans, about how they can exclude Nazis from the category of uh, political speech, political debate, and political argument. You're likely to get some version of a what are you talking about response. That is, given the history, it is not at all surprising um, that in Germany, Nazis are not considered just another political party, not just another political organization. They consist of an entirely different category. In the, concept, in the historically determined conceptual apparatus of German politics and German political debate, Nazis stand aside from everything else. And if that sounds somewhat sensible, as I describe Germany, <coughs> then that's what Chief Justice Rehnquist is saying about the United States here. Uh, that just as Nazis uh, are an entirely separate category in Germany, flag burning is an entirely separate category um, in the United States. Now, you could agree with this or disagree with this. Um, uh, certainly there are um, strong arguments to suggest that uh, at least as political protest is understood in the United States, especially as it's been understood since the early 1960s, um, there ought not to be anything regardless of its um, historical uh, origins that's outside the category. But this is a, the debate between the majority and the dissent is really a debate about categorization. It's a debate about uh, the nature of the category to which all of this applies. And of course, as you read, um, the majority prevails. Well, I guess that's tautological. The majority prevails. Uh, that's what makes it a majority. Um, uh, but um, for reasons that now should be somewhat familiar to you. That is, uh, this is an argument that is undeniably based on, the, on communicative a impact. The majority uh, says because it's based on communicative impact, implicitly this is strict scrutiny. Uh, and not, none of Texas's justifications, including this one, are enough. OK, so uh, a little bit of subsequent history now. Uh, subsequent to Texas versus Johnson that raises some uh, interesting and important issues, uh, not only just about the First Amendment, but uh, about American political culture in general. So you read United States versus Eichmann, um, dealing with the Flag Protection Act of 1989. Uh, that doesn't give you a full flavor of what actually happened. <coughs> It will not surprise you that Texas versus Johnson was not a popular opinion uh, in the United States in general. Uh, it was, uh, there had been previous flag uh, desecration opinions from the Supreme Court, but most of them had skirted the issue. Uh, um, there were uh, many of them, for example, um, went off on vagueness grounds. So uh, back in 
the 1960s, a young nam man named Valery uh, Gauguin, G-O-G-U-E-N, uh, decided to uh, express his objections to the Vietnam War, his objections to the selective service system in ways that were somewhat related to Paul Cohen's message. But Mr. Gauguin uh, decided that what he was going to do was take an American flag uh, and sew it to the butt of his blue jeans. And he walked around with the American flag on the butt of his blue jeans. That attracted the attention of the authorities. He was prosecuted under a flag desecration statute. Um, but uh, uh, it eventually got to the Supreme Court, which went off on vagueness grounds. The statute is unconstitutionally vague uh, by characterizing the uh, prohibited conduct in terms of casting contempt on the flag. There was another case called Street uh, versus New York. There were a few others. They were all vagueness cases. Texas versus Johnson was the first one to directly confront the issue, although given the outcome of the vagueness cases, not that many people were surprised. <coughs> not that many people were surprised, but lots of people were outraged. So shortly thereafter, um, there is introduced in Congress the Flag Protection Act of 1989. It passed by a vote in the Senate of 91 to 9. It passed in the House of Representatives by a vote of 380 to 38. This is interesting even apart from First Amendment considerations. That is, um, if you add the two together, uh, uh, 471 members of Congress voted for a bill almost certain to be declared unconstitutional. That is, this did not happen 20 years after Texas versus Johnson. This happened in a matter of weeks or months after Texas versus Johnson. Uh, no, there was no change in the personnel of the Supreme Court. Uh, every one of those 471 members of Congress who voted for this bill knew that the bill that they had voted for was going to be struck down by the Supreme Court. Uh, there is um, a couple of people made the argument that Congress might be able to do things that the state can't do, but certainly at the time that argument did not get any support <coughs> in the existing First Amendment doctrine. Uh, indeed, um, in the first of the important obscenity cases, Roth versus the United States, Justice Harlan had suggested that maybe the First Amendment means different things for purposes of state regulation than for purposes of federal regulation. No other justice joined that position. Nothing in the intervening period between Roth in 1957 uh, and Texas versus Johnson in 1989 suggested that there would be any difference. Uh, that is, once the First Amendment was incorporated in the 14th, the incorporation uh, treated um, state and federal regulation of speech as identical. Uh, everybody knew this in 1989, uh, and as a result, none of the 471 members of Congress, uh, unless they were delusional, uh, believed that this statute had any possibility of being upheld by the Supreme Court. And as you read, it wasn't. Uh, now, uh, now we can think a little bit politically about this, uh, about um, the Eichmann decision um, striking down the Flag Protection Act of 1989, uh, largely on the authority of Texas versus Johnson. So here's a quiz, or at least a question to ask yourself. What do you think happened to the 471 people who voted for a law almost certain to be declared unconstitutional? Mr. Gill. <laughs> okay. Do you think anybody would? Do you think it? Do you think it had a political negative for any of these 471 people? 
Spared, was that a well, I hand? I would just say that, you know, probably, I mean, I, I would imagine that the, the few that did not vote for it had right. an answer why they didn't vote for it when the re-election time came. Good, right. So it's, uh, that is the burden of proof as Mr. Baird says, would have been uh, on those who voted against it. And as Mr. Gill says, uh, the expectation is that voting for a law almost certain to be declared unconstitutional uh, would have more likely generated applause or pats on the back rather than <coughs> contempt. Uh, so this is a um, this is relevant here, but it's also relevant to the somewhat larger issue: Is voting for a law likely to be declared unconstitutional, or is voting for a law in direct repudiation of a Supreme Court opinion a political negative? for that reason. That is, we want to be precise here. Is it a bad thing politically to challenge the, a, a ruling of the Supreme Court? Uh, Texas versus Johnson would seem, excuse me, uh, the Flag Protection Act would seem to suggest that the answer to that is no. That is, that all of the work is being done by the substance and none of the work is being done by the fact of obedience to the Supreme Court independent of anything else. Indeed, um, there's some support for this um, from an event that took place in 1988. Um, in 1988, when Michael Dukakis was running against George Bush Sr. for um, the presidency, the one of the issues that came up in the political campaign was why Dukakis, who was at the, uh, when he was uh, governor of Massachusetts, had vetoed a bill requiring school teachers in Massachusetts um, to uh, conduct the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of every school day. Dukakis responded by saying, I vetoed the bill because it was unconstitutional under the Supreme Court decision of West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett in 1942 or 1943. This was widely understood to be a political gaffe of monumental proportions. That is, uh, that um, uh, defending a political act uh, because of a Supreme Court decision was widely understood to demonstrate Dukakis's uh, incompetence uh, as a potential president, uh, even by people who thought that he ought to be president. That is, even his supporters thought that this was a uh, wildly inappropriate defense of what he had done. Uh, uh, further, possibly reinforcing the view that obedience to law as obedience to law, or more narrowly, obedience to the Supreme Court as obedience to the Supreme Court, doesn't have a, uh, any particular amount of political purchase. But let's not exclude the Supreme Court from this uh, question as well. One of the other interesting things about Eichmann is the alignment of the justices is uh, exactly the same as it was in Texas versus Johnson. That's curious. That is, if you believed Everything that you learned when you were learning about legal method in the first year, you, would, you, should, be a, you should have predicted that Eichmann would be a 9 nothing decision. That is, one of the things you learned uh, is that um, courts adopt a norm of stare decisis, stand by what is decided, that doctrines of precedent in general are important. Stare decisis is the doctrine that requires a court to follow previous decisions of the same court and requires judges of that court to 
obey previous decisions of that court, even if they thought they were wrong. After all, if they thought they were right, stare decisis makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, so uh, the, the whole bite of a principle of stare decisis is saying, even if you think a decision is wrong, you have some obligation uh, to follow a previous decision, even one you thought was wrong. None of the four dissenting justices in Eichmann <laughs> seem to believe in that principle. Uh, indeed, that's somewhat consistent with the larger view that however much we talk about stare decisis in the Supreme Court, it operates as a, at best, minor constraint or maybe non-constraint. Uh, group of political scientists who write, who do political science research on Supreme Court decision making, wrote a book about 10 years ago uh, called uh, Tellingly Starry Indecisis. That is the imp uh, a careful analysis of Supreme Court decisions over a 20 or 30 year period indicated that the willingness of justices to take previous decisions as reasons for making a decision that they disagreed with was very, very, very small. Uh, and indeed, in Eichmann, we also have the somewhat narrower but related idea that we might call persistent dissent. Dissenters keep dissenting. There are occasional exceptions to this. Uh, Justice White, for example, who obviously didn't take that view in this case, used to take that view with some frequency in criminal procedure cases. That is, he would say, uh, I was a dissenter uh, in uh, this case, Miranda, for example, uh, but that view has not prevailed, so I will now um, treat this as the law. That occasionally happens, but it's not very common. The phenomenon of persistent, dis, uh, persistent uh, dissent is far more common. We see that here. Um, indeed, um, uh, it's, if we look for embodiments of this debate in general, one of the more interesting articulations uh, of what seems to be the actual fact comes from Justice Scalia, who it turns out was in the majority uh, in Texas versus Johnson. But Justice Scalia has said uh, explicitly and proudly, I do not believe in the principle of stare decisis in the Supreme Court. Um, his justifications, which will take us a little bit far afield here, are basically I took an oath to support and uphold the Constitution. I did not take an oath to support and uphold what previous occupants of my office have said the Constitution says. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, um, he expresses this position with somewhat more uh, panache than others might express it, or with somewhat uh, more uh, verve than others might express it, but the view that that he expresses and is willing to say may reflect a fair amount of what most justices have believed most of the time. Uh, so, um, but um, the dissenters uh, in Eichmann, although they are the same as the dissenters in Johnson, uh, still are dissenters. Uh, Eichmann strikes down the Flag Protection Act. Um, one other thing that might be said about this whole series of events shortly after Texas versus Johnson and shortly after Eichmann and more or less every two years ever since then, bills have been introduced in Congress to amend the Constitution with an amendment saying Congress shall have the power to prohibit the physical desecration of the flag. Typically, those amendments get a majority in the House, a majority in the Senate, but they have never gotten the two-thirds of both houses necessary to send them to the states. Um, that um, at least when it comes to amending the Constitution, 
the politics may be a little bit different. That is, when it comes to amending the Constitution, uh, voting for an amendment to the Constitution s looks like it's slightly politically riskier than voting for the Flag Protection Act, even if it is an amendment to the Constitution that would um, allow what the majority of members of Congress and the overwhelming majority of the population would like to see as a matter of first order substance. Uh, but amending the Constitution, which does, as you know, doesn't happen very much, um, uh, is itself a politically risky act. Uh, it's also a politically very difficult uh, act. Uh, once you get into the states, um, it turns out that um, 13 states have the ability to defeat a constitutional amendment. The 13 smallest states have the ability to defeat a constitutional amendment. Most states have super majority rules about voting for constitutional amendments. And once we understand that they have super majority rules, the consequence of this is that a significant minority of the legislators in the smallest 13 states in the United States can defeat a constitutional amendment. There are, there are people who have done the math on this. I have not. But it turns out that state representatives representing something like four or 500,000 people uh, can defeat a constitutional amendment if all of the mathematics uh, are aligned. Um, so it looks like a futile act uh, even from the beginning. But uh, um, it also looks like a more politically dangerous act, um, especially more politically dangerous to do something that's a matter of significant substance. Since the 14th Amendment, most constitutional amendments have been, uh, with the exception um, of um, extent of the ones dealing with voting uh, and gender and age and race, but almost all of the other constitutional amendments have been perceived as procedural and technical. We don't amend the Constitution uh, for better uh, or for worse. Moreover, it also turns out that many uh, members of Congress perceive that voting for an amendment to the First Amendment would be particularly politically risky. After all, the First Amendment has some powerful defenders. The never uh, argue with the fellow who buys ink by the barrel adage that goes back about 100 years uh, is relevant here. Uh, uh, politicians understand that they annoy the press at their peril. Uh, the press gets the last word. Um, the press is a not unbiased commentator on First Amendment issues. Um, so uh, amending the First Amendment is thought to be even uh, riskier. Uh, lots of people believe that the First Amendment was first for a reason. Uh, that turns out to be false, as I've mentioned. Uh, it was originally adopted as the third. The first two didn't get the requisite number of votes, so the Third Amendment became the first. Nevertheless, 200 years of rhetoric uh, have talked about the firstness of the First Amendment. Okay, so um, we have not yet uh, amended uh, and probably will not in the Constitution to reverse uh, Texas versus Johnson. So a little bit now about track two. So suppose that, um, and maybe the best way to talk about track two is to talk about it initially in the context of uh, a hypothetical Texas versus Johnson. Suppose that Gregory Lee Johnson had burned his flag Suppose he had been prosecuted under a no public burning ordinance, and suppose that 
he was unable to make a showing under either Yikwo or the impermissible intent uh, branch. That is, suppose he was prosecuted under a no public burning <laughs> statute under circumstances in which barbecuers, leaf burners, and large bonfire builders and large number of others were also prosecuted. He comes back and says, okay, I understand that I cannot win under track one of the O'Brien analysis. The state's interest is unrelated to communicative impact, but nevertheless, O'Brien seems to say that even incidental restrictions on communication, incidental restrictions on speech, restrictions on speech that are incidental to a law of general application, still get some form of heightened scrutiny. I am entitled because I was engaged in expression, and nobody denies that. I am entitled because I was protesting and dissenting to require the state to justify what they are doing by something better than a rational basis. And I am entitled to have the court weigh the degree of the state interest against the importance of my protest in an even-handed weighing uh, method, somewhat uh, like Castle versus Consolidated Freightways, uh, and so on. Uh, that's what O'Brien seems to suggest in terms of this track too. That's what O'Brien seems to be saying when it says the state restriction should be gr no greater than necessary. So it is against that background that we get to Clark versus the community for creative nonviolence. So here we have the ideological sleepers. The, the sleepers in Clark uh, were not sleeping because they were tired. They were not sleeping because they had nothing else to do. Um, they were sleeping in order to make a political point. Um, so uh, those of you who are now sleeping might be thinking, I might observe you sleeping in class, but actually it's a protest against the content of the class. And given that this is a First Amendment class, you are entitled to sleep as a form of protest uh, against the content. Uh, that's what was going on uh, in Clark. Um, these were ideological sleepers. But the ideological sleepers turned out to violate a genuinely even-handed law of, gen uh, of, gen uh, of general application. That is, they could not make the case that they were singled out because they were protesting. Um, if you sleep in one, uh, in one of the parks in the District of Columbia that has uh, no, uh, no camping or no sleeping regulations, uh, you will be evicted or prosecuted without regard to content, without regard to anything else. Uh, if you have no place to say, stay or if you're sleepy or for any other reason, if you do what they did, you're, you're going to be prosecuted. So the fact that they did it as a form of protest was genuinely incidental. So what's interesting about Clark, and what's maybe most important about Clark, is that the form of scrutiny that the court seems to apply doesn't look anything like even-handed balancing. It looks like total rational basis. You don't have a complaint at all in these circumstances, because this is an even-handed law of general application. Now, one thing that we might say about that and one thing that we might ask about that. So the thing we might say, or that I might say about it, uh, uh, is that um, one reason for this, one reason for the court's result is that if we take track two seriously, it's hard to imagine any law that would not generate some degree of at least close judicial scrutiny. Uh, so after all, um, if you uh, go to buy the New York Times, uh, 
uh, at the local newsstand here, you don't pay $2. You pay $2 plus Virginia sales tax. So suppose someone says, Yes, we recognize that there is a Virginia sales tax on clothes, sporting equipment, automobiles, and everything else. It's a law of general application, but by applying this law of general application to newspapers, this has an effect on the sale and distribution of newspapers. After all, we all understand our economics one. You raise the price of something, it lowers, uh, uh, it has an effect on the market. So by taxing newspapers, we inhibit and reduce the distribution of newspapers. We inhibit and, dis we inhibit and reduce the distribution of news and political commentary. And under track two of the O'Brien analysis, a court should evaluate the degree of the state interest against the um, uh, in the expressive interests and the amount of expression or the amount of speech involved. We could say this about almost anything. After all, this same copy of the New York Times, uh, I'm not sure where it's printed uh, in these days of electronic printing. For all I know, it's printed in Charlottesville, but it's probably printed in Richmond. Uh, that the content is sent to Richmond uh, electronically. They pr um, the, uh, and I'm guessing here, the uh, printing presses of the Richmond uh, newspapers are used to also, they rent out space to the New York Times. The New York Times gets printed there. It then gets put on a truck where it comes from Richmond to Charlottesville. If it comes from Richmond to Charlottesville in obedience of the speed limit, it will not get here as quickly as if it comes from Richmond to Charlottesville at 90 miles an hour. As a result, news and information that would otherwise be here at such and such a time is delayed because of the speed limits on Interstate 64. There's almost no regulation. There is almost no law. There's almost no state <laughs> policy that is not going to have at least some effect on communication. If we take the O'Brien analysis track too seriously, almost every law would have to get some close judicial scrutiny. Maybe that's why the court says, sort of consistently with Washington versus Davis, a much more controversial opinion, um, where the effect is merely incidental to an entirely innocent law of general application, we're not going to look um, uh, very carefully at all. And the language in O'Brien about least restrictive alternatives or balancing or whatever should not be taken too seriously. Now, there is a question. Sleeping is not a common form of political protest. It's not a frequent form of communication. It's a frequent human activity, but it's not a frequent form of human communication. There is a question still unanswered in the doctrine about whether track two of the O'Brien analysis has more bite to it when it is applied to traditional forms of communication than when it is applied to untraditional forms of communication uh, such as, for example, uh, sleeping. So here's another example. Any cigar smokers here? None? OK. Well, uh, uh, let's suppose that some of us were cigar smokers, even though none of us are cigar smokers. Uh, if some of us were cigar smokers, we would likely, as I hear from people I know who <laughs> smoke cigars and appreciate them, we would likely feel burdened by the fact that under various uh, 1960s era import regulations, one cannot buy Cuban cigars in the United States. However much people want Cuban cigars, however much Cuban cigars are better than other kinds of cigars, you cannot legally buy Cuban cigars in the United States. 
It also turns out you can't buy Cuban books in the United States. But you can't buy Cuban books in the United States for exactly the same reason you can't buy Cuban cigars in the United States. There is a law of general application prohibiting the purchase uh, or import, uh, with some exceptions but not very many, uh, of Cuban products. Um, so you can't buy Cuban cigars, you can't buy Cuban food, you can't buy Cuban clothing, you can't buy Cuban uh, books. Suppose there's then a challenge to the application of this law of general application to books. There are now some exceptions uh, to the law that I've just described, making a challenge somewhat less likely. Uh, but the question would be, still unanswered, is the application of this law of general application to books obviously a consummate First Amendment item, one that would be tested against somewhat more rigorous scrutiny than the application of a law of general application to ideological sleepers. Is there a book sleep distinction that tracks the distinction between traditional and non-traditional forms of communication. When we are dealing with newspapers or books or something of that variety, it does track two of the O'Brien analysis actually mean something? When it is clear that if we're dealing uh, as from community for creative nonviolence, when we are dealing with non-traditional forms of communication, it means nothing at all. Okay, let's leave it at this. Um, for those of you who are here on Monday and Wednesday, don't come to class. Uh, and I will see you a week from Monday, but Here's an informal assignment that is highly relevant to what we will be doing the Monday and Wednesday after we get back. Um, uh, spend more time than you normally would, not on sleeping, uh, you're, it's okay to do that too. Spend more time than you normally would reading about the Wall Street protests. Because almost all of the Wall Street protests, even before yesterday, totally implicate the question of what's a public forum and what can you do in streets, parks, and sidewalks. And the form of the Wall Street protests of yesterday, that is the organized march to the houses of billionaires and picketing in front of billionaires' houses, raises another issue about private picketing and the like, or picketing of private residences. So, um, the Wall Street protests are highly relevant to what we are about to do. Uh, and if by a week from Monday you're at least somewhat aware of the nature of the non-legal issues, that will make the understanding and application of the legal ones better. Have a good break.